Uh, I hope this is working. Uh, evening to everybody. At least there's people here uh, tonight. And I'm hoping that uh, there's some people able to watch online. Um, we are I'm just going to close that down. There we go. Uh, so uh, if you're watching online, my apologies. There's been some uh, some technological uh, issues uh, from uh, that we've had this today while trying to get this set up. So we're going back to kind of the old system of just using Facebook video. And hopefully this is going to work. Um, if it doesn't, uh, hope by next week we'll have it, it fixed up, I hope, and, uh, and we'll just do the best we can. But um, in any event, welcome. It's good to have some folks here for the, the study tonight. Um, we're going to be doing this for five weeks, all the way every Wednesday through November. Um, and for this course, we're going to be looking at uh, five women in the Bible, five women who are named in Matthew's gene genealogy of Jesus. Um, these are uh, women who are ancestors of Jesus and who are integral to the story of Jesus and each have their own story as well. And they're all stories that we don't tell very often. Um, they don't, for whatever reason, uh, which you'll probably figure out when you hear these stories, they don't make it into the Sunday school curriculum very often. Uh, they're a little too, uh, I guess, challenging for uh, for a lot of uh for a lot of Christians to kind of understand uh, why, you know, these, these women uh, do what they do and why their story is what it is. So we're going to go through those stories um, over the course of these weeks and just see how that fits together and why Matthew considers those, those women worth mentioning and worth talking about. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, a word of prayer and, uh, and then we'll get going. Let's pray together. Holy and loving God, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for each person gathered here, uh, each person joining us online. Uh, we pray that you will guide this, uh, this evening, guide our conversation, uh, guide us as we look at your word and understand more about uh, your, the people you have guided in the past, uh, women and men who have followed you and who have sought to, uh, to share your light in this world. Uh, we pray that we will share your light tonight, uh, that all of our discussion, all of our conversation will move us closer to, to each other and closer to you, and that uh, you will smooth out any technological issues, any problems that might come, and uh, point us more and more towards the love of Jesus Christ here in this place and everywhere where we're gathered. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Um, we are going to start just as a kind of a get us going here. I wanted to see uh, if we can name women in the Bible, uh, because, you know, the kind of point, one of the points of this uh, is to talk more about the women who we don't really pay a lot of attention to in the Bible. Uh, there's some women that I think we, we know their stories. There's a, some that we just kind of skim over when we, uh, again, when we make our Sunday school curriculums, when we preach, when we do our, our lessons. Uh, and so just shout out the names of any women uh, from the Bible you can think of. Deborah. Ruth. Deborah. Okay, I heard Deborah, I heard Ruth. Naomi. Deborah, Ruth, and I'll put Naomi because she's together with her there. Any others? Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, yeah. Mary and Martha, who are also kind of joined sisters together there. Others? Sorry? Abigail, yeah. Others? Bathsheba. Mary Magdalene, yeah. There's a, you know, you can write down Mary and that covers about like 15 different women, uh, which is kind of uh, frustrating when you're trying to keep track of them all, but uh, others? Hagar, yeah. And Hagar is typically joined with, uh, I'm sorry? Sarah, yeah. Joanna, yeah. Uh, I'll put her with Mary Magdalene because she's one of the women who uh, followed Jesus, yeah. They don't. Uh, there's a lot of women in that kind of boat who are. Uh, 
Yeah, the Samaritan woman at the well, yes. Um, we don't get a name. Ah, yes, it's not a basket. Um, yes, uh, Rahab, Rahab. Good one. That's I wasn't sure if that one would be coming up. That's uh, the, yeah. So Rahab's uh, yeah, let the spies out of Jericho and I, uh, sorry, Eve. I was yeah. There we go. Excellent. Any others? This is a good list. Deborah. Yeah, we got Deborah there. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, you're, you got a lot of the ones that I, I figured you'd get, and you got a few others that I didn't think we would. Um, Tamar, yes, Tamar is the one we're going to talk about tonight. A uh, bit of a, is there a Tamar in Ottawa? Oh, all right then, wow. Um, I mean, the, that's, that's covering a lot of the big ones. Esther is another, you know, who actually gets a book named after her, so we should probably get her down there. Rebecca. Rebecca. And Rachel. And you can put Leah yeah. with them. Um, I mean, Sarah, Sarah and Hagar are uh, connected with Abraham. Uh, Rebecca is Isaac's wife. Rachel and Leah are two of uh, Jacob's wives. Um, and as you look at the list, you know, you'll notice uh, there's a lot of kind of the wife of so-and-so, right? I mean, Abigail is one of David's wives and Bathsheba as well. Um, you get, uh, again, Sarah and Hagar, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah. Um, Eve is connected with Adam. You often will think of a lot of these women are kind of connected with Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, David and Abigail. You get that kind of connection of the famous man and then the woman who's kind of uh, the long-suffering woman, usually, who's along for the run. Um, and so, and yet there are some here that are women in their own right, right? Um, I don't know if you've heard, has anybody here heard, here heard of the Bechdel test? Um, so this is a, a, a kind of thought experiment somebody came up with when you're watching a movie um, or any kind of piece of media. If you're watching a movie, ask yourself, um, is there a, more than one woman character? Do the, those two women ever talk to each other? And is that conversation about something other than a man? And if they, all three of those things happen in that piece of media, then it passes the Bechdel test. That's, and it's just a kind of a basic, you know, are the women in this story about something more than just kind of a side thing for the men to be, you know, concerned about? Um, and so, you know, when you look at this list, a lot of these characters are, a lot of the times we treat them as just kind of side stories for the men of the Bible. Um, and, Yet there are some that are, you know, we get their story in their own right. They're the kind of the hero of their story. They're, uh, they stand on their own, not just as kind of part of somebody else's uh, narrative. Um, and there's a couple other women that we didn't mention here that are, sorry? Leah. Leah, yes, we got Leah on there. We, I added her on with Rachel and, uh, Rachel and Rebecca. Yes, well, that's right. Bilha. And Zilpah would be the other one, are the two uh, of the concubines that are also Jacob's. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Jacob gets himself into so much trouble with so many children is uh, lots of wives, lots of different children with different wives, and them not being able to get along with each other, uh, which is one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, no, yeah, Anna. Uh, there's also, there's a, a, a theme of um, women who cause trouble, the villainous women in the stories. So uh, someone like Jezebel or someone like Delilah, um, who are seen as these kind of toxic, evil women who cause trouble for the heroes uh, through their sexuality, through their, you know, conniving, through the, the kind of trouble they cause. 
Um, and and you know we we still use those names as a kind of a byword nowadays. You know, as a Jezebel is not you know a nice woman, right? Not the kind of nice girl you take home to mom. A Jezebel or a Delilah, right? Are these kind of troublemaking uh, sources of of danger? Um, and I think in a lot of these um, a lot of these stories we. We do that not just with those two, but you know, Eve gets a lot of flack for you know, and a lot of blame for uh, a lot of stuff that is you know just as much Adam's fault as hers. Um, Mary Magdalene, there's a kind of a narrative that she was a former prostitute or something like that, and that's not actually in the text. That's something that you know the church kind of interpreted later, uh, you know, which is not really fair to her. Um, we kind of equate her with some of the other women in the Gospels uh, because a lot of the women who started to follow Jesus were prostitutes and women who were on the fringes of society and found their place in Jesus's movement. And we kind of roll all those people together. Um, so this is great. I mean, there are more, lots more, and, and it's good to kind of think about uh, some of these other uh, women in the Bible and, and kind of recognize those, uh, those people. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about the uh, one of the five over these four, five weeks. Just look at these five women and uh, and see how their stories fit together and why Matthew decides to name those five. Uh, because if you look at that chapter one of Matthew, there's this genealogy and it goes through starting with uh, Abraham. Going through the list, and it says, you know, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, Jacob was the father of, and it goes down, 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 all the way through this genealogy. And obviously, every time it says, you know, so and so was the father of so and so, there was someone else who was the mother there. Mm -hmm. um, that's just how this works. Uh, but, you know, in all the genealogies and all the, uh, the generations that are mentioned there, the mothers just kind of get skipped over. Uh, we know, you know, from the book of Genesis that it was Abraham and Sarah were the parents of Isaac. Um, you know, it was Isaac and Rebekah who were the parents of Jacob. It was Jacob and Leah who were the parents of Judah. Uh, but when Matthew does the genealogy, he doesn't mention all of those. And on many of them, he probably doesn't know. They didn't record them. Um, it, it brings to mind, um, you know, in the old days, uh, and probably not just in the old days, when you did a wedding, you know, uh, the minister would ask, you know, who comes to present this bride to be married or something? And the father would stand up and say, oh, I present, you know, da, 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 your father's job. Blah, blah, blah. And yes, who gives this woman away, right? And, um, and it's the idea that that's what the father is doing, right? This is a transaction of, you know, one to another. Um, and we, that sometimes still happens. Uh, most of the time when we do a wedding now, uh, there isn't that kind of exchange of property, or at least the both the mother and father stand up um, to kind of recognize, because it, it does. It's not just, you know, uh, Abraham didn't just, you know, snap his fingers and pop Isaac out all on his own. Uh, and frankly, he did a lot less of the work uh, that was involved in making Isaac. Um, and that's true for every single one of those generations. But uh, there are these five women listed there that Matthew specifically calls attention to uh, in naming, you know, these, the, this, this situation that has brought about Jesus into the world. And Matthew's gospel is really very much concerned with how Jesus fits in to the, the greater story of uh, the people of Israel. Uh, when Luke, Luke also gives a genealogy of Jesus, Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Luke's gene uh, is, is looking at Jesus, not just in the context of the Jewish people, but in the context of humanity. Uh, but Matthew really wants to see Jesus in that Jewish context. Uh, and so starts with Abraham, goes through David, goes through these generations to look at that, but then shows these five women uh, who, who kind of challenge the story that we've been given of, of Jesus, uh, of of the people of Israel. Um, and those stories are stories we know from elsewhere in the Bible. We're not just, we don't have to guess at who those five women are. We can go and read their stories. So that's what we're gonna do in these, uh, these weeks over the next five weeks. So here are the, the five women. Um, it says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. 
Uh, Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba. And then at the very end of uh, that genealogy, it says Joseph was the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus. Um, so those are the five women we're going to talk about. Four from the Old Testament, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. And then uh, the, our last week, we'll talk a little bit about Mary to kind of see the, uh, and, and how that connects into Jesus. All right. And so just to kind of situate you, if, in case you need a little bit of a refresher on the Old Testament, because I know not everybody's got uh, the Old Testament entirely sorted out. Um, you've got the story of God's people starting at the beginning. We start with the patriarchs when the God's people, you know, all fit in one family. Uh, all were one little group, starting with Abraham, uh, his son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and then Jacob's 12 children, uh, his 12 sons. And you get, uh, you know, that family was big and messy and a whole bunch of trouble, but they're one kind of recognizable family going through the world. Uh, and then they end up in Egypt. They're in Egypt for a long time. In Egypt, they grow from a family into a nation, a huge, sprawling group of a million people that ends up enslaved and then is finally uh, freed from it, uh, from slavery through the Exodus, Moses, and then Joshua lead them back to the promised land. Uh, in the promised land, we have the rule of the judges. They're led by people like Deborah, uh, people like Samson. Uh, and then after the rule of the judges, you have the kingdom established. You have Saul, David, Solomon, kings like that. The kingdom splits into Israel and Judah. And then uh, those kingdoms are conquered by their enemies. They're taken away into exile. They're brought back. Uh, to reestablish their homeland. And then that's when the Romans come in, take over, and that's when we get the story of Jesus. And so these women are, that we're going to talk about are from all throughout that history. Um, and so we're going to start at the beginning with the patriarchs, uh, way back in the time of, uh, of Genesis. Uh, and that's where we get the story of Tamar. And so again, in these stories, we're going to ask, you know, who are these women? What do they all have in common? Uh, why are they included in Matthew's story of Jesus? Why should we know their stories? And uh, just as a warning, these are not always, you know, safe, clean, family-friendly stories. Um, these women, all of them, face tragedy and trouble and, uh, and have to make hard choices. And it's not always the kind of clean, you know, church-friendly story that you kind of expect on a Sunday morning. Um, and so if you're expecting, you know, uh, the kind of little Lord Fauntleroy patted on the head, everybody did a good job and got a gold star, that's not what these stories are. Um, and we can see God's grace working through these stories, but they're, they're difficult and they're, they're, uh, there's trouble. Um, so we're going to start with tonight with uh, Tamar. And Tamar's story can be found in Genesis chapter 38, um, but there's a lot of kind of context you need to know to, to kind of get where this story is coming from. And so I'm going to kind of walk us through the story. If you want to follow along in Genesis, you can, um, but I'm going to kind of try and give some of the context to that story uh, as we go along through, um, because there's a lot of kind of, this is again, a long, long time ago. We're talking about Bronze Age, uh, society when things were in some ways very, very different and in other ways not so different maybe uh, from our world today. And so as we go through this story, um, at, what I would like you to think about is what words would you use to describe Tamar? Uh, what is she like? What kind of, uh, what does she seem like when you hear those words about uh, the story of Tamar? Uh, what does she care about? What are what her motivations? Um, the other big character in this story is Judah. And so uh, what does Judah seem to care about? What is Judah's motivation? What is he, he trying to find? And then uh, finally, what does God seem to care about? And that maybe you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit to see, well, what, what is God doing in this story? So everybody kind of ready for... Uh, for the, we, yeah, we kind of all set the stage now. So let's get to uh, the story of Judah and Tamar, which is really, frankly, the story of Tamar. She's the, 
the hero and the one who makes the action happen. Um, so we have a man named Judah. And again, Judah is a patriarch, right? He is one of the sons of, uh, of Jacob, uh, of Israel. Um, and really of the 12 sons of Israel, he's the fourth oldest. But all three of his older brothers elsewhere in the book of Genesis uh, all disgrace themselves terribly in one way or another and are kind of written out of dad's will or at least dropped down in seniority. And so Judah kind of officially, unofficially is the kind of oldest son uh, in, a, in some kind of honorary way. Uh, the three older brothers, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, uh, all for one reason or another are, you know, uh, get themselves into trouble and, uh, and end up dropping down the, the list of uh, seniority. Uh, and yet Judah, frankly, as we'll see, is not all that much better. Again, we think of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these are the, the heroes of the Bible, these staunch, you know, and when we think of Judah, he, he gives his name to the tribe of Judah, which is, you know, David's tribe, uh, the people of Judah, the kingdom of Judah later on in the Bible, and to the Jewish people all derive their name from Judah. So this should be one of the, the heroes of the Bible again. Um, and yet Judah is not really all that you expect him to be, particularly in this story. Uh, and so we have Judah. And Judah has, uh, gets married and has three sons. Uh, for oldest son is named Ur. Uh, second son is named Onan. Third son is named Shalah. And they, they grow up, they get old enough, and Judah decides to get, have his son get married, and his son Ur gets married to a young woman named Tamar. And then uh, right after they get married, before they have had children, tragedy strikes, Ur dies. And we are not told why. All we are told is that he did something terribly evil, and God punished him with death, which is a pretty grim thing for us to hear. Um, we don't know what exactly Ur did, um, but this is kind of the, the Genesis way of saying he had it coming. Uh, this is not just a random tragedy. This is not a boo-hoo thing. Genesis, the, the writer of Genesis feels like, no, Ur uh, got what he deserved. The problem with that is uh, that Tamar is left a widow. And so this is where you kind of have to understand the way this society worked to, to kind of get where the rest of the story goes. Uh, in this society, women did not really exist in the social public sphere. Um, if you were a woman, you could not just go about in public on your own. You existed in connection with a male family member. That was your, you were part of a household with a man as the head, and that man was the one who did all the public relations, and you were within, you in that domestic sphere of that man. And so when you were born, that man was your father. You were a member of your father's household. And then when you got married, you became a part of your husband's household. You were under your father, your husband's tent, that your husband was your public connection to the world. And when your husband died, you connected to the world through your son. You would be a, a part of your son's uh, household um, until you died. And if you didn't have sons, your daughter would hopefully be married and you could join a son-in-law's uh, household. But you couldn't really exist on your own. And so to be a widow without any children was essentially... You, you, you ceased to exist. You didn't have any way of, of interacting with the world, which is why when you read the Bible, uh, there is so much about demanding justice for widows and orphans, because God wants to make sure that this society does not just let these people fall through the cracks and disappear and, and have no support, that you know, God's law calls for the people to care for the widows and the orphans, uh, to bring justice for them, to speak up, you know, when there's no one else to speak for them. Um, and when you read the prophets all the way through the Old Testament, you see those stories of people calling for justice for these people who are at risk of 
of disappearing and being abandoned. And many of the stories we're going to look at are these, you know, women who are in that vulnerable place who, who exist on the margins of this, uh, this world. And so Tamar, when her husband dies, is vulnerable. She, her husband is gone. She has no children. And so the, the safety net that they had come up with in this time was something called leveret marriage. And the way that worked is that if your husband died before you had had children, you would have another male family member would get the widow pregnant so that she could have children and they would be the children of her dead husband. Uh, and so usually a brother would sleep with the widow, get her pregnant so that she could have a child, and could then, that child would carry on the dead husband's name and legacy. And that, I, I know, seems really strange. Um, from our perspective, again, this all sounds like, you know, why can't women just be people? You know, to be fair, women weren't considered legally persons in Canada until like less than 100 years ago. Uh, so it's not like we're that much better off, but this was their way of solving the problem uh, you wanted, you know, to carry on the dead husband's name. You wanted to provide for the widow and give her still that household to interact with the world with. So a brother would come and have sex with the widow, get her pregnant, and that child would then be the, ch the child of the dead husband, not the brother's child. Okay? So what should have happened next is Ur has two younger brothers, Onan should have agreed to impregnate Tamar so that she could have a baby that would be Ur's baby and he would get the inheritance. Onan decides that he doesn't want to do that. And it's not entirely clear why. Um, it's possible that he figured, you know, if Tamar never has a kid, I get my brother's inheritance and I get to keep it for myself. It's possible that he was just a terrible human being um, and was just being selfish. But what Onan decided to do was he went and slept with Tamar, but practiced uh, what we would call the pull-out method of birth control. Uh, Genesis says he spilled his seed on the ground. So he had sex with her, but then ejaculated on the ground instead of getting her pregnant, which is, is just about the worst thing you could do in that situation. If he didn't want to get her pregnant, he should have just not had sex with her. So he, he's both violating her. I mean, this is rape, right? Essentially, this is sexual assault. Having sex with her under false pretenses um, and taking advantage of her vulnerability uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to rape her. Um, and you know, again, if he didn't want to go and carry out his obligation in the society, you know, it would have been better just not to do it rather than to torment her this way. And so we reading this should read this and think Onan is just a terrible, terrible human being. Uh, the, the fact is that God agrees because God sees Onan doing this and considers this such an evil, evil thing that God puts Onan to death as well. God, Onan's punishment is death. For this act of rape and betrayal and sexual assault, Onan's punishment is death. Now, just as an aside, um, if any of you have heard of Onan's name before, it's because Onan has been used by the church as a cautionary tale against the evils of masturbation. Yes. If people, the, the church took this story and when they read the line about Onan speed, spilling his seed on the ground, they said, oh, Onan's problem was that he was masturbating and that's why God killed him and therefore God will punish masturbation with death. Now that is not what ha this story is about. This story is about rape and sexual assault and a lot of evil things, but it's got nothing to do with the church using it as a kind of a cautionary tale, but we still, if you look up Onanism in the dictionary, that's another term for masturbation, because that was how the church misread and misused this story. That's just an aside. 
uh, but it, it shows how we tend to take, I told you this is not Sunday school appropriate, right? Like uh, there, this is what we do with the Bible when we take it and try and take it down uh, places where it really, you know, we, we interpret it to, to get to our own ends rather than reading it for what it is. So, I, I, yeah, it, it's, well, it's kind of like Game of Thrones, honestly, right? Like, you know, you've got uh, people turning on each other and backstabbing and everybody's dying. Um, and but, and then, again, this is just, this is the, the story of this world. This is the, the place that they're in. And again, this story eventually gets to Jesus. Uh, we're not there yet, I know. But Judah, so back to Judah. Uh, Judah now has two of his sons have died in sudden, unexpected, tragic circumstances. And like a lot of powerful men in the history, Judah looks for somebody to blame and decides that the person to blame is Tamar because it must be her fault somehow. Um, and so Judah decides, he knows that in the societal obligation, he is expected now to still provide for Tamar by his third son, Shalah, should then get her pregnant. But Judah thinks that it's Tamar's fault his boys are dead, despite the fact that we know his boys are just awful, awful human beings who had what, you know, got what they were coming for. Uh, Judah decides it's Tamar's fault and therefore he does not want to give his third son uh, to Tamar to, uh, to, to fulfill the obligations that his family owes to her. And so he tells Tamar, uh, my third son is too young, to marry you yet. So go back to your father's house, live there as a widow. When Shalah is old enough, we will send for you and then Shalah can take care of what he needs to do and provide you with a son. And so Tamar agrees. She goes back to her house. Uh, but Judah has no intention of actually keeping that promise. He's, this is essentially a death sentence for Tamar. She's going to go back to her father's house and she will live there until her father dies and she will be destitute and out on the street. Um, and so that really should be the way this story ends, except that Tamar decides she is not going to be a cautionary tale in somebody else's story. She decides she is going to take ownership of uh, this story. And so uh, years pass, Shalah grows up, Tamar has figured out by now that there's not really going to be ever, uh, you know, a, a chance for Judas to keep his promise. So uh, she hears that Judah is going into town uh, to, for a sheep shearing festival. And so Tamar sneaks out of her father's house, uh, leaves her widow's garments and the, the robes that mark the mourning of being a widow, leaves them behind, and puts on the garb of a prostitute. And she goes and waits by the road where Judah is going to pass by. And when Judah passes by, Judah sees this woman waiting at the side of the road and says, how much? And Tamar says, well, for you sailor, uh, one goat. And Judah's like, well, you know, I'm all fresh out of goats today. I'm sorry. And Tamar's like, no, no, don't worry. Uh, just give me your, uh, your seal and your staff and I'll hold on to them and you can send me a goat tomorrow, right? And so, you, and a seal and your staff is basically your identification for the world. Uh, this is your, you know, you're basically like your driver's license and car keys today. So Judah agrees. He gives Tamar his uh, seal and his staff. They have sex. Judah goes about his business. Tamar sneaks back to her father's house, gets back in her mourning clothes and her dress and uh, as a widow and waits. And the next day, Judah sends his friend down to look for the uh, prostitute and with a goat to give her and they can't find her. She seems to have disappeared. They ask around, everyone's like, no, we've never seen a prostitute in these parts. And, uh, and Judah decides, well, you know, if we keep hunting around here, we're gonna, look really stupid. So let's just chalk this one out to a loss and go home. So he goes home. A few months pass. And then Judah gets word that his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who is supposed to be living as a chaste and virginal life as a widow, 
is pregnant. And Judah does what powerful men do. He gets up on his high horse and he decrees this condemnation and this, you know, how could you betray us like this? How could you, you know, and, and she must be killed. She must be burned. She has, you know, a fallen woman, an evil woman. How dare she bring dis disrepute onto our family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so she condemns her to die. And Tamar is being led out to be burned. As she's being led out, she sends a message to Judah that if you want to know who the father is, here's his seal and his staff. Like mic drop, there's Tamar's story. But yeah, it is literally like she has him, right? She has got him to rights. And, and Judah admits it because uh, he is faced with, you know, the ear, in, incontrovertible evidence that this is his own mate. Um, and he, his, his answer to this is, he says, she is more righteous than I am uh, because I, I didn't give her my son the way I, I had promised. And, and it's right. Tamar, you know, posing as a prostitute was the more righteous thing to do in this situation because it meant that she could get justice. It meant that she could get what she was owed. And again, God agrees with that assessment because uh, Tamar is pregnant and she gives birth to twins. And twins are always a sign of God's blessing and God's uh, abundance. Twin boys especially is a, a double helping of blessing. This is a clear sign that yeah, Tamar has God's seal of approval for doing this. And again, we, when we think of, you know, how women are supposed to act in the church, in our society, in, you know, in any situation, we would not go to Tamar as, you know, this is the, you know, the role model we should follow. But in this story, at least, God holds up Tamar as this was the right thing to do. This was the righteous action to seek justice that was denied to her. And there's, a, there's an irony in this story that you know, the only way to exist outside of a household, a woman outside of a household uh, who doesn't have a father or a husband or a son to, to be their public sphere, the only women you would encounter with, encounter in that uh, situation are the, the destitute and the prostitute. And what, so what Tamar does is say, well, you know, you are forcing me. The only life you are leaving open to me is a prostitute. And if that's the only life you are going to leave open to me, then I am going to go and, and do that. But I'm going to do it in such a way to get what you owe me, to get what is rightfully mine, to get the justice that you have denied. And so again, this is not a story that, uh, you know, that is easy to, to read. It's a story that, you know, this is a woman who does not have an easy life. Uh, she has a husband die. She is, is assaulted and misused and abused uh, by the people she trusted. She is lied to and cheated and just sent away to die. And yet she takes this action to, to get justice, uh, to get what is, is rightfully her, and God rewards that. And again, she acts in a way that is not by the book, right? Uh, she uses her sexuality as a tool to get what she is, is owed, is what she deserves. And, and we have this history in the Bible of looking at these characters who use their sexuality as a weapon, Jezebel and Delilah, you know, this kind of idea that those, these are these evil fallen women. Well, Tamar is a woman who doesn't, you know, uses her sexuality, but in order to get justice, in order to get what is rightfully hers. So again, this is a really strange story. Um, it is, and it's a story that, you know, we wouldn't think of when you're thinking of Jesus's grandma. Um, this is probably not the kind of story we would, that would leave to mind. And yet when the, the, 
writer of the Gospel of Matthew was telling the story of Jesus, this is one of the women he said, this is someone we need to remember in recognizing what got us to the story of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in that sense, there's this kind of cosmic uh, justice in that, that, you know, the, the, these two evil sons who, you know, committed these terrible things, uh, we don't know what Ur did, but it's presumably something pretty bad. Um, and there is a sense of this balance being restored that through Tamar, you know, she is blessed with, with sons. But the credit for that is entirely Tamar, right? Judah is, Judah does not come off well in this story, right? Um, he's, you know, and he says that himself. His, his best moment is when he owns up to, yeah, I, you know, I've made a mess of this. She's the righteous one here. Um, and, and so, you know, for a patriarch, for someone who gives his name to the whole history of the story of uh, the people of Israel, uh, Judah is, you know, does not come off well. And, and really, when you read this story, you're seeing that, you know, it, it really is Tamar who does the action that leads to the, the good outcomes. Tamar is the one who gets things back on track and leads to justice. And so it makes more sense, you know, when you're doing a genealogy to say, you know, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah. Well, not like technically, yeah, but Tamar like was the one, the driving force in this whole story to make it happen. And so it makes sense that we would mention her and give her credit for that and, and, and call attention to her actions that brought about justice being restored. And then that that was an essential step in the story towards Jesus. Any other questions on, uh, on anything there? Yes. So it, it does, in the story, it does mention that uh, Judah's wife had died when he went to uh, the sheep shearing festival and went to the prostitute. Um, and so, I mean, that, I guess, makes it slightly less... Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no. And, and, you know, and not a very perceptive one, frankly. I mean, I don't know how long it had been since he saw his daughter-in-law. Uh, but he was clearly, you know, he was not thinking with his brain uh, in this whole process. Um, and, yeah, I mean, again, she does not come off well here. Well, one of the, the recurring things we are going to see in, this, in these stories is... Um, yeah, the sins of the fathers are visited on the sons to the third and fourth generation, right? Uh, that is, you know, a truth in the Bible that we sometimes interpret as, oh, you know, we're going to, the children will be punished for what their fathers did. And I don't think that's what it means. What it means is what parents do wrong, their children inherit and, and copy and pass on, right? This kind of cycle of abuse and, and evil and... Uh, and cruelty that, you know, children learn that from their parents and then they pass it on to their children. And that cycle can be deadly. Um, and we see that, you know, we definitely see that with Judah. His boys are rotten to the core and you kind of figure that, you know, that's probably Judah's fault. Um, and to be fair, Judah's dad wasn't that great of a father either. You know, if you know the story of uh, Joseph and the, you know, the favoritism there and the, you know, the, uh, Kind of callousness that Judas, uh, that Jacob treats his um, his other children with, and the favoritism he shows to Joseph. And again, Judas, the fourth uh, son, and the first three all get disowned for other acts of evil and uh, abuse and and misdeeds. And so there's a family history here, which again, it it when you have this idea of the heroes of the Bible being these upstanding, virtuous, you know, paragons of good and right, and then you find out that they are, by and large, horny old men, um, and scoundrels, and ruffians, and, you know, uh, it, it is bracing uh, 
to, you know, when you kind of realize that. I think a lot of what we learn in Sunday school about the heroes of the Bible kind of needs to be unlearned as we get older and see that, you know, these heroes were very human. Uh, you know, King David, we're going to get to him in a few weeks. David is, is very, very human. Um, and he's, you know, that they're, they're Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There are still acts of faithfulness and good that they do, but there are also acts of real, you know, cruelty and evil that they commit. And, um, and God calls them to account on those. And those, those actions have consequence to their children and their children's children. And so what we see here is, yeah, that, that the, you know, these, this is not a story of just good people always doing the right thing and getting blessed by God. This is a story of God reaching out to very flawed, very broken people and bringing good out of those stories, even in the midst of our brokenness even in the midst of our, uh, our completely missing the point and completely missing the mark, God still finds ways to bring good out of brokenness. And ultimately, I think that's the story of, of all of these weeks, as we're going to see, is God bringing good out of brokenness. And in these stories, the person who suffer, the people who suffer the most from that brokenness is almost always the women. And in these stories, the people who manage to be God's instrument for bringing good out of the brokenness is almost always the women. Um, you know, there's, there's, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there, there are, there is one, um, one unassailably good guy in all the stories we're going to hear over this next month. Uh, there's one mensch who we'll, we'll get to eventually. Uh, but pretty much everybody else is pretty broken and flawed and troubled. And yet God still uses these people to bring, uh, to bring good and to bring ultimately Christ into the world. Um, so let's think about those, uh, those questions for a moment there. What words would you use to describe Tamar in this story? Mm-hmm. Sorry? Yeah. Desperate, yeah. Yeah, I got desperate, smart, um, victimized. Yeah. She was a greedy one. She went back to her father's house there for a while, but then she not let him realize <laughs> that for her own self preservation, yeah. she needed to be courageous and go do something. Yeah, courageous. Manipulative, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in the best... Street smart. Yes. <laughs> manipulative. i got to remember how to spell this. Manipulative, uh, street smart, yeah. Street smart. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there, there is uh, this cleverness and this uh, resourcefulness, you know, that she, um, you know, She's not afraid to break the rules to get what she needs to do, you know, to, to technically break the rules while really following the rules again better than, than Judah. Uh, other, other words to describe uh, Tamar? Justice. justice, yeah. Yeah, she's seeking justice, right? And, and she will go to any length to get it. She's not going to sit around, you know... Um, out of that desperation, out of that victimization, because she, she suffered, right? She really, like, this is, uh, you know, she's widowed, uh, and then on top of that, widow, uh, widowhood has compounded this extra suffering again and again and again, and yet out of that, she takes charge and, uh, and makes, you know, makes this thing work, uh, makes justice come uh, through her own actions. Yeah. Anything else? Resourceful. Yeah, yeah, resourceful for sure. Yeah, like uh, clever. Like she's like, it's a pretty good plan. I mean, it depends a lot on Judah being a horn dog. Uh, <laughs> but apparently, you know, <laughs> apparently that was the easiest part of the whole scheme, right? It was just, you know. All, all Judah needs is a pretty girl on the side of the road, and he falls right into the trap. Um, so, but she knows that that's who her father-in-law is, 
And so she is able to use that knowledge to get what she needs to get. Um, and again, she is ultimately righteous. Um, you know, Judah says, this woman got it right. This woman did what was right in our society and in the eyes of God, and I didn't. Um, yes, yeah, perceptive. Uh, how about Judah? I mean, we've, we've kind of already, uh, we will just put horn dog down here. And, <laughs> Yes, that sums it up in fa somewhat family-friendly language. Um, what does Judah care about? Justice. Sorry? Justice. Uh, does he? He cares about himself. Yeah. He cares about himself. He's self-centered. He's, yes. Um, he cares about his, his children, his sons. Uh, he thinks, you know, he puts the blame for what, uh, for what happens to Ur and Onan on Tamar, even though it's clearly up, so he does not really see his children for who they are, right? He doesn't really recognize the trouble that they're causing. He's not very perceptive. Uh, he's, yeah, very, very selfish. Um, and, and, you know, even that, there's a little moment in the story where, um, uh, you know, they, they go to pay the, the, the goat to the prostitute, and uh, they're looking for the prostitute. It's almost a it's kind of a comedy of errors, really, right? These two old guys stumbling around town with a goat under their arm, like, hey, is anybody like, you know, the lady, you know, the lady. Um, and then they can't find her. And then it says, you know, uh, Hira returned to Judah. I couldn't find her anywhere. The men of the village claim they've never had a shrine prostitute here. Uh, let her keep the things I gave her. We sent her. I sent her the young goat as we agreed, but you couldn't find her. We'd be the laughing stock of the village if we went back again to look for her. So again, yeah, it is the almost like this ridiculous, like the two, these two old guys wandering around town with a goat looking for, you know, uh, to, to pay their bill. And, and, well, yeah, and, and, and like the thing he is most worried about in that situation is that he will be a laughing stock. The people that his own reputation, that's what he's concerned about, right? He does not want people looking at him being like, Oh, you know, there's Judah, ha, 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 which we are all doing now, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's trying to kind of preserve that kind of uh, his reputation. He cares about his reputation. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and again, he's got at the end of the story where, you know, he finds out uh, Tamar is pregnant, and he suddenly transforms into, you know, this paragon of virtue, you know, oh, how dare you, you know, have sex out of marriage. I would never do such a thing as I, you know, deliver my goat to my brother. Like, he's, he's so hypocritical, right? He's so, uh, and, and, you know, it, you read that and you think of these, um, you know, the political and the church leaders, the moral majority, you know, uh, your Jerry Falwell Juniors, you know, the, these people who, who love to get up in their, on their high horses and proclaim all these rulings about, you know, uh, how women should behave, how women should act uh, and, and use their sexuality while behind closed doors, they are doing whatever they want, right? Like that's Judah. He's, you know, this, this hypocritical, uh, yeah, yeah, your Jim Bakers, your Jerry Falwells, your, you know, all these kind of, you know, they're, they're, they get to do whatever they want in their own, the privacy of their bedrooms, but they have a lot to say about what everybody else is doing. And, yeah. So, he's, he would have been a powerful, a wealthy landowner, as uh, you know, Jacob, his father, had amassed a lot of property, and Judah, as the kind of de facto heir, was a, a wealthy landowner. He had flocks, he had houses. Um, but also, you know, because there was this relationship between Tamar and Judah and Judah's family, that there was a kind of an understanding that she was, you know, he said, wait there and eventually you'll come back and we'll have this relationship. And so now he's kind of claiming, oh, she broke the contract. She has brought, you know, she was supposed to be uh, having, you know, carrying on our family's legacy and now she's broken that. And therefore, she needs to be punished. And it's a convenient way for him to skip past the fact that he's the one who broke the contract. 
He's the one who tried to weasel out of it and, and abandon her when really, you know, and, and now he's using this and jumping on this opportunity to paint her as the bad guy when really it's, you know, it's just an excuse for him to get out uh, and, and be, you know, set free. So then Shalak can marry somebody else and without any guilt, without any kind of social repercussions. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, he's, he's acting like he cares about justice, right? He's acting because by the strict rules, yeah, if she had gone off and, and been a prostitute somewhere, and, you know, that would have been a violation of the social code. Um, again, Judah kind of forced her into it by, you know, saying there is no life left for you. You can't get married again because you have to wait on me, but I'm not going to give you my other son. Therefore, you have no life but just to waste away and eventually die unless you go out and, and you know, make a living as a prostitute. That's the only living available for you. And then when she does that, he jumps and says, aha, you've broken the rules, now you die, right? And so technically, yes, he's got a legal argument until he finds out that the only person he, she slept with was him, and which was, a, again, a, some male relative, what she was owed was a child from a, a, one of Ur's male relatives so that that would carry on Ur's family name. And so really all she took was what she was owed. Uh, it should have come from one of the brothers, but if it comes from Judah himself, it's fair enough. And so it's, you know, yeah, Judah thinks he's following justice, but that's because he, he doesn't have the full story. He doesn't really recognize uh, and he's paying lip service to justice, but, you know, it's this hypocritical kind of, uh, you know, I get, I get justice when it's convenient to me, but you don't get it when it's convenient to you. Self-righteous, Self yeah. Yeah, Marie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adultery is not a solo activity. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 And Jesus, you know, Jesus, all throughout Jesus' ministry, he is speaking up for these people who are on the margins, these people who are, uh, that society has cast aside. And that, that is especially women and widows and orphans and the oppressed. And when you look through the Gospels and you see how often these people who have no voice in their society, they find their voice in, in Jesus. Uh, that is the story all the way through the Gospels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ex oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, it's all these people who have no other way of speaking up, who have no other way of being heard. Jesus hears them. And, you know, the, the story of the, the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, Jesus meets her and talks with her. And there's, you know, there's a, a barrier there of class. There's a barrier of gender. There's a barrier of race that, you know, this is a Samaritan woman that a Jewish man should never, ever talk to any Samaritan because they are, you know, the heretics and the trouble. Um, and yet Jesus crosses all of that. And, and speaks to this woman and, and, you know, invites her into a place in his ministry, in, in, his, uh, in his kingdom, offers her living water. And that's what Jesus does all the way through the Gospels. And you see that in all the stories we're going to talk about. These women are people who, again, have been pushed out to the margins of society. And yet, uh, God blesses with uh, you know, justice and with the, the, the things that they need to survive and to contribute to this great big story that God is telling that leads to Jesus Christ. Uh, so what, yeah, what does God care about in this story? Tamar. Yeah. Yeah, Tamar is not just a footnote in 
God's eyes. Tamar is not just a speed bump in the story of Judah uh, that just gets kind of run over and discarded and sent back to, you know, die far away somewhere. God is somebody who cares about what happens to Tamar. Yeah. Why did God allow Tamar to be killed? Yeah, that, that, the, the, the confusing thing about this story is, you know, the only way that Tamar can get justice is to go to this kind of ridiculous length of having to disguise herself as a prostitute, having to go and, you know, seduce her father-in-law. And it, you know, it would have been, it would have been much easier for God to just say, like, you know, come on, Judah, what are you thinking? I, and again, it would be even better if this society wasn't built in such a way that women are forced to go through this rigmarole just to exist in the world. Again, uh, we can we can sit here and condemn this society, but you know, in so many ways, our society is not all that much further on. We again, we still have that idea of who comes to give this. You know, I, I present my bride, I give my daughter away as if we are passing a piece of property from one household to another. We, that language is, you know, even within the last uh, 10, 20, 30 years, those, that language is still used in marriages. And so, uh, you know, Tamar has to use her own resourcefulness, her own, uh, you know, her own uh, clever wits to get her... Again, to, yeah, to exist in that society, she kind of needs to have a, a child. And, and to, in order to engage with the world, she needs to have uh, children. And the women, yeah. Her, yeah and, and if she doesn't, you know, when her father dies, um, then all of his property, she can't inherit it. It would be inherited by either, you know, if she has a brother, it might go to a brother. If she doesn't have a brother, it would go to you know, um, a cousin or a, you know, somebody distant, it, and, and they haven't, they, they could maybe keep taking care of her, but if they want to cut costs, they can just turn her loose, and then her only way to, to provide for herself would be prostitution or begging or something like that. And so this is her, you know, to have a child, to have a family, is the, in that society, uh, her best hope of survival. Um, yeah. She, yeah, it, her, her only kind of way to have a future in this society was to have children um, and to have those children in the right legal way through this marriage. You know, if she just has children uh, outside of that legal structure, you know, they, they wouldn't be in, able to inherit anything. They wouldn't be able to provide for her. They would just be, you know, orphans and wards of the, you know, the world. There's no social safety net here. There's no, uh, you know, uh, public resources, there's no food banks, there's no kind of way to, and so she would just be reliant on charity and on whatever she could manage to get for herself. And again, this is a story we're going to see again and again and again the rest of these weeks that, you know, that what happens when these people, when there is no safety net, what happens to these women when they don't have resources to fall on? And they do end up having to kind of fall on their own wits and their own ability, and yet, you know, God... Like, we have this idea that the thing that God cares about the most is, you know, that you are acting in the proper way and checkboxing off the little check marks of, you know, attend Sunday school and, you know, date chastely, hold hands, get married, you know, have 2.5 kids uh, and, and, you know, attend church every Sunday and that that's the right thing to do. Um, and that if you, if, you, if you break any of those rules, you are therefore outside of God's grace, outside of God, you are a fallen woman, you are trouble. And, you know, this is, the, there's nothing against any of that. It's all lovely to attend church and go to Sunday school, all that good stuff, 2.5 children, all that lovely stuff. But 
what God cares about in this story is not, you know, was Tamar following all the rules? Was she being a good, virtuous, you know, proper lady, right? Ladylike. Tamar is not ladylike, right? Uh, and, and you know, if she had been ladylike and stayed waiting, trusting, virtuous in her father's house, she would have died penniless. Uh, she would have suffered greatly and died. And instead, she breaks the rules and she goes, and, and God rewards that and says, yes, that was righteous because you were going, you valued justice more than propriety, more than the culture's ideas of holiness. And God feels the same way. God values justice more than what we call holiness and, and proper behavior. Um, So in order to she knew, she knew that was a, that was a crime. Yes. She knew that. Yes. She in order for it to be legally right, it had to be a male from her husband's family. In order to carry on the, the leverage marriage, it had to be a, a, a man genetically related to her father, so that those children would be considered her dead husband's children. Um, and so it had to be either Onan at first, or then Shalah. And you know, failing that Judah, and so she it had to be a male related to her husband, and again, she probably figured that Judah was the easiest mark, uh, right? For the reasons we have mentioned, uh, he was somebody that she could get to, and she could get what she needed from him, um, because Shalah was out of her reach, and and she could not actually meet him and you know be given what she was owed, what she was rightfully owed, Maureen. Yes. Yes. And, and so in this culture, again, there's this great deal of, you know, the value, a woman's value is in that private domestic sphere as a wife and as a mother. And, and so, you know, and there's this, this kind of regular story of women, you know, as you mentioned, Hannah and Elizabeth, Sarah, um, are all women who struggle to have children. And this is a real burden and a real trouble because of that idea that, you know, in order to pass on the family's legacy, the family's honor, the family's story, we need to have children. And so seeing a woman just for her own value uh, is not something that they were able to see. It's always seeing them in that context as a mother, as a, as a spouse, as a, you know, in connection with that. And so this story does not really subvert that, right? It does not really, again, there's some part of us that would kind of like Tamara to burn her bra and, you know, kill Judah and just march off and start a commune out in the countryside or something, you know, I, I, that would be great to see. Uh, and, and, but what she does here is, is not that kind of countercultural thing that, you know, there's that little voice that would like to see that. Uh, she's still working within her culture and within the values of that culture, but she's also subverting them by taking charge in them and saying, yeah, I'm going to work with this system, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to make it my own. I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take ownership of it. And so I'm not just this passive piece of the machinery, but I've got an active role to play. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, yeah, there, Judah is like, you know, it, yes, he's not all that perceptive, um, but also, well, he's not expecting to see his daughter-in-law in that context. Um, and, you know, in that context, how much he has seen his daughter-in-law when you usually would see another, a woman that you were not married to is in the context of robed and, you know, you'll see their face, you'll see them, you know, 
at your, your son's wedding is probably the last time he's seen her. It's been a few years. Um, it, you know, so it, you, you can give Judah a little bit of credit that, you know, it, it's understandable maybe that he did not recognize her. He hasn't seen her in some, uh, you know, at least a few years. He has not seen her in that context. He's not expecting to see her in that context. He's expecting her to play her part and be the virtuous, you know, chaste widow hiding away in a cloister somewhere and not expecting her to have taken, you know, actions into her own hands. Um, and so, yes, you know, uh, it, it is a little bewildering that he just doesn't recognize her, but how, you know, how has he ever really seen her? I mean, not just like seen her, but has he ever really considered her as a human being before? Uh, you don't get that impression from the story that he has ever really noticed her before. He's just seen her as, you know, an obstacle to his family's fortunes. Um, and, and he has done his best to ignore her and to marginalize her. And so it's not all that surprising, you know, again, powerful people, powerful men often just don't care about the people that, um, that they, that they run over. Uh, there's a, um, there's a mystery set of mystery stories by G.K. Chesterton, uh, and he's a, he's a writer in the 1900s, uh, or late, sorry, late 1800s, 19th century, um, and he, he was writing all these mystery stories, and um, Father Brown, Father Brown stories, I don't know if you guys have read some of those, but this is, one of the stories is um, this person is, is murdered in, a rich man is murdered in his house, and there was somebody watching the, the door all the time, and they said, oh, no, nobody went in. Nobody went in. Um, and he said, well, somebody had to go in because somebody, like, somebody murdered him and, and came out. He's like, oh, no, I was watching the door all day. Nobody important went in. I'm like, well, what do you mean by important? Oh, well, you know, the mailman and the, you know, the, the milkman and all these people went in, but they're just the servants. Well, one of the servants killed him. But in, that, the, in their eyes, they didn't see those people as worth noticing. They were just the rabble. And therefore, and it couldn't have been one of those people. And so the, you know, Father Brown points out, well, yeah, you, you know, maybe if you saw other people as human beings, you would have noticed what was really happening. Maybe that's why, you know, this happened. And that's what's, I think, part of what's happening here is Judah, you know, he does not see Tamar as, as a human being until he is completely outwitted by her. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a veil over her face as a prostitute, so he would not have, you know, he would not have seen her face, um, and there, you know, there would have been makeup, there would have been a way to present herself, so, uh, I, yeah, I mean, it is, uh, yeah, Judah just, again, Judah does not come off well in the whole thing, right, and so you can certainly say he's just not very perceptive, uh, but the, the, I think the, the root problem is he doesn't see her at any point in the story as a human being worth noticing worth caring about, worth valuing. Um, and he just sees her as an obstacle to his family's success until she forces her him to reevaluate who she is. Yeah. And, uh, how would you decide her role? I don't know, Doug. I mean, you know, you want me to do an impression here? <laughs> like, uh, I... Again, if you haven't, if he hasn't heard her or seen her in probably at least 10 years. Um, so, you know, if you think of a family, a distant family relation you haven't seen in 10 years, uh, who walked, you know, and the last time you saw them was, you know, in a bank, and then you run into them in a, on a beach in Mexico, um, and they're suddenly wearing completely something different, you might not notice them. Um, and maybe they're able to, you know, maybe she sounds different, you know, maybe she was, you know, uh, a 12-year-old a girl when she got married to her and, you know, was probably that young when she got married and maybe now she's, you know, in her mid-20s. Uh, maybe she's changed a lot. Uh, there, there's a lot of ways that this could be explained. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He had, he had other things he was worried about. Yeah. Yes. And, and yeah, I mean, the logistics of how, you know, the, the story happens is, is ultimately, 
you know, yeah, Judah's priority in this is always himself. And God's priority is, you know, God cares for Tamar, God cares for, <clears throat> for justice, um, and, and wants Tamar to get the justice that she deserves. And that, uh, and again, that that is more valuable to God than this kind of, this twisted sense of holiness and propriety that these, you know, uh, these powerful men are using to keep the, this woman in line. Uh, God is on the side of justice for this woman, not on the side of the rules and the proper behavior. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I'm sure God would have given a little push on that. I'm not convinced that Judah needed the help. Again, I have a very low opinion of Judah's uh, moral character. Uh, but, you know, if, if God decided to give him a little bit of a, you know, uh, temporary blindness, I, I, I could buy that, sure. That was the only thing that was so, what, one sec, yes, sir? Yeah, yeah, right after his big dramatic speech about, you know, I mean, how dare you besmirch our family's honor? And she's like, you know, you want to know who's besmirching the family honor? Judah. Da -da. Like, yeah, he gets, you know, for somebody who's worried about becoming a laughingstock, uh, and, and again, he owns up to it, and hopefully this is the beginning of, uh, you know, some better life choices for Judah, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't hold my breath, so yeah. 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 And the idea that a woman would be able to pull a fast one on Judah is not something that Judah has considered, you know, uh, as a possibility. Um, and again, that is what that that is what changes. You know, his mind changes. So again, you know, God's priority in this story, and God, the blessing God puts on Tamar, um, is this blessing of this abundant, you know, this twin sons to carry on her family, and really it is her family that, you know, you're carrying on. Yes, uh, Judah contributes some of the DNA, but you get the sense here that these are, you know, Tamar is, uh, is the one who is taking th this family and moving it forward. And it does, it specifies that, uh, you know, Judah does not sleep again with, uh, with Tamar. He does, you know, he doesn't try and pull a fast one ever again. Uh, which, you know, is a small credit to him, I guess. Um, so, yeah, this is just some of the, these, these uh, questions, you know, God is, uh, Tamar is resourceful, clever, she's determined, she seeks justice, and she is considered righteous. Uh, the one who pretends to be a prostitute and, you know, cheats somebody and tricks them into uh, sleeping with her is in the end declared that that was the righteous thing to do. Uh, Judah is this selfish uh, man who only cares about his own appearance, about his own family, who thinks that he and his sons are always right and innocent and that it must be this woman's fault. Uh, and then put, puts, punishes Tamar for what his sons have done, punishes her for and considers her guilty. And God is the one who cares about justice, who punishes evil, right? God, you know, is not hands off in this story for Ur and Onan, certainly. Um, and God defends and rewards the innocent. God cares for Tamar and protects her and guides her and blesses her in this story. And again, it's, it's, it's extra frustrating that this is a story, again, about how God wants justice more than this sense of propriety and the sense of this fake holiness and things. And yet the way the church has used this story is as a weapon for propriety, right? To, to threaten people against masturbation, which is not what the story's got anything to do with. Uh, it's, it's frustrating that we have taken the story and used it into, in the exact opposite way of what God is trying to say here. And, and again, as we were saying, this story, it points us forward to Jesus, that Jesus is someone who comes and cares about justice and does not really care about propriety and the right 
things, about not healing on the Sabbath, about following the proper rules, about not spending time with prostitutes and tax collectors and these fallen people that, you know, the, the religious leaders consider beneath him. Jesus is there with them on their side, demanding justice for them, because that's where God is. All the way through the Bible, that's where God is. Um, and so there is this connection between that story of, you know, we see that here in, in you know, 2,000 years before Jesus' birth, we're still seeing that story starting with, you know, God's passion for justice ahead of this kind of blind rule following. And that that's what God wants from us, that we are not called to just blindly follow the rules of our society that say to, you know, do the right thing and check off the, all the boxes and be a good little boy and girl. But we are called to, you know, if, if getting justice requires breaking a few rules, go do it. Because justice is worth it. And it's worth it for the outcasts and the oppressed and the people who are on the bottom, you know, it is worth it to defend them and to, to bring them the justice that God demands for them. That is worth breaking some rules. That is worth, you know, letting propriety go a little bit. So, no, and that, I mean, technically she didn't, which is the amazing thing about this story. Technically, she doesn't even really break the rules. She just, you know, from the, from the outside observer, somewhere along the line of getting the prostitute's veil on, or negotiating the goat price, you know, you might think, whoa, Tamara's kind of lost the plot here, but she hasn't. She, all the way through, is following this righteous course uh, of what justice is. But justice is not defined by, you know, the propriety of our world or by the propriety of our religious leaders. Justice is defined by what God has decreed. And God here is right on the side of the widow, of the orphan, of the oppressed, of the, the victimized, of those who are suffering, God is on their side and demands that they get justice. So we're we're running low on time here, um, and so I, I well yeah I think we're we're just about done there. So any last questions on the story of Tamar uh, on uh, anything we've talked about tonight? Again, all of these stories are going to be a little outside of our comfort zone, a little bit you know if you thought having. Uh, a discussion about masturbation and sexual assault and uh, horn dog patriarchs. Uh, I'm, I probably should have warned you beforehand, but then maybe you wouldn't have showed up, or maybe more people would have showed up. I don't know. Uh, but this is this is going to be, you know, we are talking about women in the Bible, and when anytime you talk about women in the Bible, there's going to be conversations about sex and class and violence and. Uh, poverty and injustice and that's going to come up again and again and again all the way through and again these are the five women that Matthew mentions and draws our attention to to say these people their lives matter it, it makes a difference you know in the story of Jesus that these women lived how they lived what they did that tells us something about what God cares about and it tells us something about what Jesus cares about so uh, we'll leave it there. I, as I, I will try always to get done by nine o'clock so we're not here forever. Um, I really hope some of the people watching online that this works because otherwise, uh, uh, you know, but uh, we'll, we'll say a, a word of prayer and then I'll, uh, next week, hopefully, God willing, Mel will have things uh, hooked up better so we've got it running a little bit better. But um, if it doesn't work, uh, we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, we'll deal with it next week. Um, so next week, we're going to be looking at the story of Rahab uh, from the book of Joshua. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that next, uh, next Wednesday. Let's, let's close with prayer. Holy and loving God, thank you for this night. Thank you for the story of Tamar, uh, for her courage and her resourcefulness and her persistence and her pursuit of justice. Uh, Father, help us to open our eyes to see the people in our world, uh, the people who have been left on the margins, the people who who we ignore, who we do not see, and help us to put aside uh, the things we think are important, our own ideas of propriety or rules that we think we need to follow. Uh, help us to set that aside and seek your justice and seek your truth and to uh, be a voice for those who are voiceless, to, be, uh, to stand on the side of, of those who, who need our, our help and our love. 
uh, and help us to know that when we stand with those people, the least of our brothers and sisters, we are standing with Jesus Christ. We are standing with you. And so go with us now in the, uh, the, the days ahead uh, until we are get back again together. Uh, guide us and strengthen us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Good night.